All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the June 25th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. I'm gonna call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Brand? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Coonerty? Here. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, people to have a, take a moment of silence and then rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes to our agenda today? Uh, yes, we have a few corrections and additions. On the regular agenda, item um, number seven, there's additional materials, a revised attachment B, packet page 21. On the consent agenda, on item 45, there's additional materials, revised attachment B, packet page 592. Item 52, there's additional materials, revised memo, packet page 638. And then we have an addenda on the consent agenda. This is item 73.1, which states, authorize the chair of the board to write to Governor Newsom before the July 9th, before July 9th, 2019 deadline to urge the governor to use his authority to require a consistency review of the Bureau of Land Management's Central Coast Field Office proposed resource management plan amendment and final environmental impact statement for oil and gas leasing as recommended by Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you. Great, thank you. Now, are there any board members that would like to pull any items uh, today? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we're now going to move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. It's also an opportunity for you to speak to about items that are on our consent agenda or if you can't stay later because you have to get to work or have another obligation and you'd like to speak to us about items on your regular the regular agenda, this is your opportunity. If you'd like to speak today, please uh, rise, you know, get in line and, um, and speak when you'd like to. Good morning, Clay Kemp, Executive Director of the Seniors Council and Area Agency on Aging. As your board's aware, the city of Watsonville has defunded the Watsonville Senior Center uh, via the Association of Watsonville Area Seniors. And I would encourage the board to be involved in that process. And the reason I'm encouraging that is a very large percentage of the funding that the county provides to senior programs is distributed or delivered at the Watsonville Senior Center. So if that center loses its infrastructure, <coughs> the funding that all of you are providing gets at risk or gets affected and not in a positive way. That center has a long history of problems and challenges, so I'm not necessarily here to say that you should fund it or take action to keep it under the current structure, but whatever structure evolves out of that, this board and the county is very invested in terms of the commitment you've made to the programs that serve there. So at this time, the center is being looked at by a closed committee of the city council, which does not have public input. Um, none of the providers or funders are at the table. I really um, just encourage your board to get involved or assign staff to do so. We as the probably second largest or maybe first largest funder of that center are also trying to be part of the committee that develops the future of it. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Shalak Kavanis, and I have the honor of serving as the chairperson to the Mental Health Advisory Board for Santa Cruz County. I'm coming here to say uh, thank you for your support. We've had a lot of turnover this year, and you guys have done an amazing job of filling those seats. We're really uh, awesome to see the South County Behavioral Health Facility up. I know there's been a lot of um, setbacks with PG&E. The investment that you've done with our VA Center has been awesome. I also want to say that Greg Kaput's been almost at every th meeting. Thank you so much. Eric Rera, the Director of Behavioral Health, has been at almost every meeting to provide insight and support. And we have an amazing staff person by the name of Jane, I'm going to mess it up a little bit, uh, Boons Kurvsky who's just been an amazing job of helping support. So from the uh, mental health 
uh, advisory board, thank you so much for your guys' support and helping us keep the best job running we can. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Roseanne Ferris and I'm a registered nurse at Watsonville Community Hospital and we the nurses here um, found out June 6th that there's the possibility of our hospital being in the process of being sold. And we have serious concerns and are holding a urgent community um, healthcare town hall. And this will be on July 14th from 2 to 4 p.m. at Watsonville City Council Chambers. And we're inviting the community and um, definitely the supervisors to come and attend. We would like to discuss how we can work together to safeguard vital services for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Coonerty, honorable members of the board. I'm here this morning to introduce um, some of our new leadership at Health Services Agency. And um, first I'll start off introducing our new medical director and then I'll turn it over to Eric Rear to introduce our new children's director. Um, so Tyler Evans is, um, he'll say a few moments, a few words about himself, but he joins us as our new medical director at our Emmeline Clinic. He will also serve temporarily as the chief medical officer until uh, we have that approved position approved in our budget and we'll go through the process of having a chief medical officer position to oversee the work in all of our clinics. And we're very, very pleased to have him join us and I'd like him to just say a few words about himself. Thanks. Great to be here. Uh, I know I have two minutes, so I'll, I'll kind of speak qu uh, quickly, but I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about my background. So um, prior to this, I was chief medical officer for uh, an FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center in uh, Orange County. So we were mostly focusing on the homeless, looking at substance abuse, uh, a number of other issues too that are affecting sort of underserved populations. Uh, prior to that, I was the national director of infectious disease um, at the uh, largest community-based HIV organization in the US. Uh, and then uh, I was also the infectious disease director at an FQHC up in New York, um, started a refugee clinic up there, um, and uh, started actually a refugee and asylee health coalition up in New York City. Um, I like to describe myself as sort of a humanitarian first who happens to be a doctor. Um, I also worked at uh, Indian Health Service, I was community health director over there, and um, served a number of missions with uh, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontieres, Doctors Without Borders, uh, working in Sudan, working in Congo, actually heading back out to Congo next month, uh, focusing on gender-based violence um, and a little bit on, e on Ebola as well. Uh, worked on the Ebola response back in 2014, 2015 with Partners in Health. Um, I am coming back next month, so you know, no worries there. And uh, you know, I just really want to kind of sort of dig in and focus as much as I possibly can on the issues that are affecting Santa Cruz. You know, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I know we have a number of uh, populations that need a lot of help, and I just want to help out as much as possible. So, thank you, and welcome to the county. Thanks. Oh, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Not much of that. I, I wish you had to pick someone with experience. <laughs> Good morning, board. Um, I'm Eric Riera, I'm the Behavioral Health Director, and it's my honor today to introduce Lisa Gutierrez Wang. Um, she is our new Children's Director and comes to us from the Bay Area, and I'm also gonna ask her to say a few words about herself as well. Hello, good morning, it's an honor to be here, and I'm very excited to step into this position. I was born in Watsonville, and most of my family is here, so it's wonderful and a homecoming of sorts uh, to be serving Santa Cruz County. I'm a clinical psychologist, um, and as Eric mentioned, most recently I've been working in San Francisco County. I was the director of clinical programs at Center for Youth Wellness, a nonprofit organization started by our California Surgeon General, Nadine Burke Harris. Um, so the work was really focused on identifying children who have been exposed to early life adversities or childhood um, adverse experiences. And so I look forward to working with a dedicated team of children. I've been so welcome since coming in. This is my fourth week. Um, and I look forward to supporting them in our continued work with children, youth, and families. Um, I'll also note that it's been amazing to see the partnerships um, that we have and the strong working relationships that we currently have with family and children's services and juvenile probation. And I look forward to continuing to uh, to really strengthen those. So thank you so much. Thank you, welcome home. Welcome. Thank you. 
Ellen Timberlake, Director of the Human Services Department, uh, Chair Kennedy, members of the board. It's an exciting time to work in health and human services. I wanna welcome our colleagues from the health department. And I also have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Keith Bostick. He is our new Child Welfare Director. He comes from the state of the Georgia where he was the Director of Child Welfare Services for the state. He also has held positions in the past of the Deputy Commissioner for Early Care and Learning, um, as well as extensive background in behavioral health in Florida. And so I'll let him say a couple of words, but we are thrilled to have such a leader of national prominence working in our county. Thank you, Ellen. Good morning. Good morning. It's exciting to be here and be before you. As she indicated, I'm Keith Bostick, and I come to you by way of Georgia. Uh, I have been in the child welfare arena for the last 38 years, providing an array of services, direct services as well as leadership roles. Um, this opportunity here in Santa Cruz, you know, uh, is just an awesome one. One that um, I come to with recognizing the great partnerships and great teamwork that's already here. Uh, my colleague Lisa and I actually started on the same day. So mental health and child welfare um, ha had this unique relationship from the start. Uh, my philosophy is that I care about children, families, and communities and the communities they live in and the communities that they come from. Uh, my focus also is how do we normalize that it is each and every one of our responsibilities to ensure the well-being of each other. You know, I describe it as the work that I do is provide services and supports to children, families, and communities who happen to have. And when I share it like that, I can do the parallel process with each of you and say that at some point in time, each of you will have a need or will happen to have a need. And so when we begin to look at it like that, then we can lift each other up. And so I'm real excited about the opportunities here. I'm real excited about um, the work that uh, children and families are doing, as well as its strong partnership. And so I look forward to having a connection and to working shoulder to shoulder with you. Well, welcome. welcome, welcome, it's nice to have you. Good morning, I'm Paul Binding from the Agricultural Commissioners. I'm addressing item 46 on the agenda, which is the uh, to request from the Agricultural Commissioner Juan Hidalgo to uh, accept and file the uh, annual report. And I wanted to make mention that this is a very, um, uh, it's a milestone year for us. It's 25 years on July 3rd that we uh, made our first entry, our first uh, service request and uh, a treatment um, for mosquitoes. And since then, uh, we started two men, in a, two men and a mule pretty much in, <laughs> in uh, 94. Um, and and now uh, we've got a very inspired sp staff, uh, a nice facility. Uh, thank you, board, for that. And also, um, uh, thanks through the years. I know you weren't there for the starting of this uh, district, but uh, you and, and uh, your, your staff have uh, really been helpful in, in making us a success. And uh, our objectives for this year are to increase public knowledge of our services um, and especially the uh, underserved part of the community. Uh, also, our secondary uh, objective is to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, we hope to have a special 25-year party at our open house, and I hope you can attend that later in the year. I'm gonna put some copies of, uh, if you accept uh, the or item on consent, well, I'll put some copies in the back of the room for uh, anyone that doesn't have a hard copy uh, that wants to take one. Otherwise, I'll distribute them electronically and they'll be on our website. So thank you very much, board. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations on 25 years. As I listen to people talk about health and the well-being of the community, there's an area of damage to our health that is almost uh, always eliminate it, not discuss, and that's ex exposure to biologically damaging microwave radiation from wireless sources. Now, I think I gave you a copy of this DVD called 5G Apocalypse Extinction Event. Is that correct? And can I have an indication who saw it? 
this is very important to understand what this is about, and I'm going to, it needs to be halted. We're in big trouble from these exposures, the tremors I have, I call microwave tremors. Cell tower tsunami to hit your neighborhood soon. Verizon has pro proposed to erect over 80 new cell facilities in Santa Cruz County. Local officials have admitted that the telecom industry plans to install more than 40 small cell antennas per square mile in our community and front of our homes and all of our neighborhoods. With the collusion of federal, state, and local governments, telecom corporations are permitted to violate our health and safety with ever increasing levels of microwave radiation. Thousands of existing U.S. cell towers violate federal emission limits. Uh, some by as much as 600%. Once installed, these towers are not monitored, um, and the industry may broadcast at any level. Thousands of peer-reviewed studies by scientists independent of the industry conclusively prove serious long-term health effects from current exposure to wireless technologies, especially for children. These include cancer, neurological disorders, including ADHD and ADD, heart disease, sterility, including permanent DNA damage, diabetes, tinnitus, headaches, and insomnia. Insomnia, new generation technology, 4G and 5G is exponentially more harmful as it has shorter microwave uh, pulse frequencies. We are being, let's see, subjected to a dangerous experiment without our informed consent. We need to stop this assault and genuinely protect our community. Thank you. Hello, board. Uh, Brent Adams of the Warming Center Program. I'm super excited to share uh, Connecting the Dots. It's, a, it, 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 it's meant to be a partner to the point in time count. It's a survey that we do every year with student interns. This year we use eight student interns uh, from the USCSC from the sociology department. What it does is uh, uh, asks 30 questions of people, uh, unfortunately uh, people sleeping in and around the downtown core, so it uh, doesn't speak c completely about the, the county homeless population. It is about the homeless. Uh, and ask 30 questions like, where do people go to the bathroom? Where do you get drinking water? Where, did you where do you normally sleep? Have you had citations in the last 12 years? We think it's a really important data set for when you're thinking about funding and what's really happening out there, because a lot, there's a lot of information about homelessness, but no needs-oriented data set. And of course, maybe it seems a, a little strange that the Warming Center would be giving something like this, but what we do is we don't put our name on it. It's student interns who don't addre address it. So it's not really an academic survey, but it does give you a picture into local homelessness, and I hope you look at it. Last year, it informed the need for a storage program. More than 80% per of people said they needed storage immediately. We're just celebrating our first year with the storage program, day and night storage program within downtown Santa Cruz. Almost 500 people have used the program so far. 200 people are currently on the sh uh, shelves. If you go downtown, it's a vastly different look and feel than it was two years ago, where we had piles of things up and down the street. Now there's nothing. Uh, people can walk around without having to carry the burden. Now the data set is informing that what people need immediately is laundry services. You might have heard about the laundry van, but it's T very small program. Uh, we're opening at the, at the storage program uh, called Laundry Wednesdays. Anyway, I'm really excited to share this with you. I'll give each of you a copy. It's also, if you go to warmingcenterprogram.com, you can see all, our, all of our work there and the data sets there and also the methodology. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Seeing none, I'll bring this back to the board uh, for, uh, sorry, sir, do we do Sorry? No, not, not you, Brent. Uh, so there's no public comment? Yes, this will be our final public comment unless there's someone else who'd like to speak to it. Uh, okay, yeah. Please use the microphone if you, if you don't mind. Okay, Michael Stewart, Duffy, 2613 Monterey Avenue, SoCal. Okay. Uh, at one time, I uh, told you a while ago, 
uh, ha have a life estate now. You know, I had the property or whatever like that. I have a life estate, but it's kind of bunk if, uh, if I have a studio and a life estate and the studio gets caught on fire and, uh, and, and, and then the, uh, the landlord, the guy who's now taking over Rob Long, takes it over and uh, starts dumping my stuff. He takes the stuff out of the studio and, uh, and, and, uh, and now he's, he's, he's uh, went over the field and, and uh, plowed down the field and he's got a motor home out in, in the field now. So it's, the place is really worse than it was. And plus, I don't like the idea of having my stuff stolen because that's exactly what happened. I mean, I mean, if you have stuff one day and it's not there the next or it's, or it's, or it's somewhere else, it's moved up like my car that was there when I, when I first had the stroke, my car was there when I came back, the cars moved out into the field and now it doesn't have a window it has all kinds of problems, and, 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 and just last week, he moved all kind of stuff. He started, started trying to fix up the area, but what he did was just, he just plowed a lot of the wood and, and, and debris over next to the car, what was left of the car. And I'm just really getting tired of it, and, and uh, I tried to talk to him the other day about it, and try to get any problem. Well, you know, it's just, it's, I can do whatever I want, type of thing. I go, well, you know, don't I have any authority? Do, don't, don't I have a, a type of a, an okay to do stuff? And he's like, so whatever, I can't, can't explain what's in his mind. All I know is that I, I was supposed to get so much money per, per, per month, and uh, I haven't seen that lately. So... Uh, Guess I got to call the lawyers and stuff. Also, an another thing, just a, a, a side note. Uh, I heard that the farm is back on the knowledge. I heard you you were there the other day, and uh, but uh, I didn't get to go to the meeting. I didn't hear anything in advance or anything. And so, so is the farm going to be a? Uh, I heard a long time ago that they were going to make the farm into a community center, and uh, and that's why they allowed them to build all the low income housing. And uh, they haven't done that. So I'm wondering, is a SoCal gonna eventually get a, a, a SoCal museum? Okay, thank or, you, thank you. Okay, the time's up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to us today? Seeing none, I'll now close public comment and bring it back to the board uh, for action on the consent agenda. These are items 70 or 7 through 73.1. Uh, on our agenda, or sorry, sorry, 11 through 73.1 on our agenda. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of items that I wanted uh, to talk about and, and uh, add uh, additional direction on two items. Uh, the first item is item number 36, which is the uh, report on measures to reduce the number of people held in jail before trial. As we talked about during budget hearings, this is a, um, uh, an issue that's uh, uh, affecting uh, future planning for facilities. Um, this item proposes that we only get an annual report. I think we should get at least a report twice a year and ask that uh, we get a, this report back in January uh, so we can track to see how the concurrence rate is going and, and how we're doing uh, about on our pre-trial release program. Um, on item number 38, I'm very glad to see, uh, as the Sheriff's Office uh, talked about during budget hearings, that the uh, Sexual Assault Forensic Examiner Program will be returning to Dominican Hospital um, after having been over the hill. Uh, this is an issue in which we hear a lot from uh, members of the public, and I appreciate the work of the Sheriff's Office to ensure that we have appropriate staff uh, and that the needs of um, women who are uh, sexually assaulted can have their needs met here in Santa Cruz County rather than having to go over to Santa Clara County. Um, on uh, 
Uh, item number 44, I want to appreciate uh, our Workforce Investment Board and their work on these pre-apprenticeship grant. Uh, the apprenticeship program is a very worthwhile uh, program. I had the pleasure of attending a graduation program last year. Uh, when you see the numbers of people who are in apprenticeships or in jobs, uh, you can see that the, it really works out pretty well and I'm really glad of the leadership uh, by our office and I'm glad to see Monterey County coming along to do their part uh, as well. On item number 48, which is the uh, vacation rental hosted rental status report, um, this is, uh, according to the ordinance, supposed to be an annual report and I hope we see this annually. I want to give an additional direction uh, that uh, we, uh, that they come back in December uh, with some kind of waiting list program for uh, those uh, areas where there's limits on each block. Uh, it's become a problem with people who uh, live in the neighborhood, uh, losing out the opportunity to have a vacation rental to someone who's just moving into the neighborhood. We, uh, we have worked to make sure that the uh, permit doesn't go with the house, um, uh, that it goes with the individual and the individual moves, it becomes available, and we have to find a better program for that. So I, I've talked with the planning director and I'm asking to come back in December uh, with a waiting list program so uh, that can better serve the needs of people who live here. Um, I think that's all. Okay, Supervisor Friend. Uh, good morning, thank you, Chair. I do have a couple of things. On item 32, which is expressing uh, an item with Supervisor McPherson to express the commitment to create an age-friendly environment, specifically on applying for the AARP age-friendly community status. This is specifically to support and complement the work that's already been done by the Seniors Council, and so we'd just like to have additional direction that specifies specifically that this is to support and complement the work that the Seniors Council is doing. On item 33, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, I appreciate you bringing this item forward. Just uh, maybe some additional clarification to also include our local delegation as those that would be included in the letter would be useful. On uh, item 48, I, I support Supervisor uh, Leopold's comments. I also like to make a, a couple of comments, which is to note this is on the vacation rental component, that in the last five years, uh, we've seen a more than doubling in the number of permits per year of vacation rentals. From five years ago to now, we have nearly 100 a year. We're not building 100 new units a year, so I think that there is a real significant impact on our housing stock. And so there's two things I'd like to see as part of this December uh, report back. One of them is that there's a statement in the report that talks about the number of about 200 permits that have expired since 2016, and I just want a, a little information as to why. I mean, was it that the board had, had initiated a requirement that you actually not park on a permit in order to increase the value of your house, but you had to use it. So are these people that aren't using their permits, or are these people uh, that decided that they didn't want to become vacation rentals anymore, and if so, what happened to the status of those homes? The second thing is that I think that we're actually reaching a point, at least within the Seacliff and Aptos designated area, that we have to look at whether these caps are too high. And I'd like to come back with a, a look, a report back in December as to, what, uh, as to a model for additional restrictions on the number of vacation rentals specifically uh, within at least our zone. And if there's interest in my colleagues for their zones as well, uh, I think that that's reasonable. Again, we have not built the number of of homes in my district per year that are converting into vacation rentals. Nobody can argue that there isn't access uh, to visitor serving accommodations in this county. They're never full other than on, on graduation weekend, so I think it's reasonable that we start putting in additional restrictions on that. I would like in the LOTA if we're gonna be looking in. So on that direction then, I think the additional direction will be to come back with what additional caps would look like. Uh, in every district. In every district. Uh, other than maybe the fourth where it doesn't, nobody's applied in the last seven years. So on, on item 58, I appreciate the work of our public works director regarding the measure D sales tax revenue and uh, bonding component. I'll, I'll say uh, very bluntly, I was disappointed in the RTC's interpretation of, of the, um, of the measure, I recognize that they are the entity that controls the bonding. It doesn't preclude us from doing it. I find it curious, though, that they allow the county to manage all of our own resurfacing projects and therefore take on all the financial responsibility and risk for it, all the trail projects and take on all the financial risk and responsibility for it, all the freeway overcrossing projects, and we take on all the risk, but yet we're not allowed to say what we want to do with our money in advance and take on that risk. So I'd like to add additional direction on that the chair write the executive director of the RTC saying that if, if the RTC is not willing to allow the entities to come together to bond, that the RTC then 
uh, bond as a regional organization so that we can actually get this work done. As we're seeing 30% cost increases on road repairs every single year, we have a funding mechanism that's solid for 30 years. It's absurd to have an entity uh, hold that money hostage when we need to get this work done, and I think that we've got a, a willing set of partners here to do it, and it's about time that they <laughs> actually step up and let us do that. So that'll be additional direction on a letter from the chair to the executive director of the RTC. Thank you. Great. Supervisor McPherson. There's a couple of issues that I'd like to uh, address on um, the consent item uh, agenda. Um, on number 20, the heap and cash awards uh, that are coming down. I want to thank Randy Marr and Elisa Benson uh, for working on these allocations with the Homeless Action Partnership, or HAP. Uh, it's complicated. It's a complicated relationship uh, between the state and the county and HAP, but we're working through it and they are doing an excellent job of getting through that process. I do continue to be concerned about how diffuse these recommendations are. I'm worried that the funds uh, are spread too thin to establish a North County Navigation Center under the mandated timelines. Uh, I'm glad th that it's worked out in the South County with the assistance of the Salvation Army as seen in these recommendations today. But I remain concerned about the North County, uh, as outlined in today's report, uh, the 1.4 million recommended by the HAP for the city's acquisition of Seaburg in my uh, district uh, will not come back to us for two months. Um, I'd just like to know maybe a little, if I could maybe ask one question, just what's the status of the North County and what's the future, uh, there are the nature of the delay um, at this point. Yeah, maybe if I could, if I could, sure. Mr. Chair. Just Absolutely, it looks like coming forward. Good morning, Board. Uh, Rainy Marr, Homeless Services Coordinator. Thank you. And um, this is a complicated real estate transaction. It is taking additional time. Uh, we are working in partnership with our real, real property division and county council on uh, structuring this. And for this and a couple of the other capital investment contracts, we are trying to be very careful and make sure that we've structured it in such a way that um, there's no possibility that the funds will go unexpended. Um, we did have a meeting just as recently as Friday with the city manager's office and their economic development division uh, to talk about the real estate transaction and kind of their progress on it. But we do anticipate bringing that to your board in August. Okay, I would look forward to hearing from you in August. Thank you. Thank I'm just you. concerned about how it's gonna be implemented in the North County. And I, I know you are too and everybody else is too. Yep. I share the concern and we're working through all of the issues to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on item number 21, um, we have a, um, a new uh, eight-year lease with Dominion Voting for our new voting systems here, and I think uh, I want to uh, compliment uh, our county clerk, Gail Pellerin, on having some uh, community proposal or uh, presentations uh, throughout the county, as well as down in the basement of this county. Um, and just to tab, just to explain a few of the things uh, that are going, it's going to be an enhanced voter experience. I think it's going to be easier for voters to just have a dot rather than connect the lines. And all voters uh, get paper ballots that will be scanned and tabulated here in, at 701 Ocean. Uh, there's uh, more transparency and more audit options that are available under the system. Uh, there's no data stored in these units. The system is not connected to the internet. Um, and I, I think that uh, the vote by mail, it's um, going to the ballot voters in the military and overseas, um, and to voters with disabilities, that's going to be a more convenient uh, voting uh, um, experience for them. Uh, where, as I said, this voting uh, system is being leased for eight years, uh, and there's a dollar for dollar match by the state. So I just wanna give some comfort to voters coming in the next year's election that we are going to have a an election system that's verifiable, transparent, and uh, we have a great oversight with our um, with our county clerk and her whole office. I want to thank them for putting this together after we had been de decertified uh, by the state. Um, I, I joined with on item 32. I joined with uh, Supervisor Friend on the age friendly community. Um, I, I would especially like to thank the Seniors Council and the Area Agen Agency on the Aging for being on the forefront of this initiative. They've worked with us very well with the cities. I'm a member of that uh, agency, as is uh, Supervisor Caput, and developing funding for the program. And uh, 
we really look forward to having uh, a, a bigger focus on the elderly citizens of our county, uh, making it a, a truly an age-friendly community. On item 41, um, the HSA uh, drug recovery tracking, I, I think that the, the chair, you might be having a comment on that. Um, I, I just wanna thank the HSA for the report and I understand there may be some limitations to collecting the data, but we want to make it a data-driven uh, decisions on that. Um, a day or a meeting doesn't go by when we wanna thank uh, Public Works for bringing the projects on items number 52 and three, the storm repairs, uh, especially in my district in Lompico, we have let uh, me know how critical this repair is in the event of an evacuation for fire up there. Uh, there's only one, um, one way in and one way out and only one lane. So we uh, are very pleased with that and thank Matt Machado, uh, Steve Wiesner and the whole public works team for getting on that. And uh, we'll help, we're hopeful there'll be future extension on reimbursements by the Federal Highway Administration at FEMA. Uh, and we wanna thank Public Works Director and all his, for his work and communicate that need to Washington, D.C. It's an iffy hope right now, but um, it's gonna have a huge impact on to us if we don't get those extensions in the millions of dollars. Uh, I wanna just thank them for getting on it and being very, very uh, proactive and trying to make sure that we get those extensions so we can be uh, paid for the, the work that's been done on our roads. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Cabot. <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll comment on uh, item number 20. Uh, there's $2.9 million that's uh, uh, allocated for Santa Cruz County. I think it's, a, it's an attempt on our part to um, address the homeless issue that is very complex. Uh, it deals with addiction. It also deals with mental health problems and, um, and also uh, poverty and, uh, it, and shelter and everything. And so we, we have a partnership with uh, uh, the Association of Faith Communities, the Salvation Army, Community Bridges, Monarch Services, and a contract amendment with a homeless services center. And uh, I think this is gonna be beneficial to both North County and South County. And uh, I believe we're gonna be using that money wisely and. I'm looking forward to seeing these programs. Uh, we do have the mental health uh, uh, facility that'll be opening up in South County. I wanna thank uh, Schlock for uh, speaking out and uh, that'll, that'll be opening soon. I'm not gonna say a date because there's always something that seems to be holding it up, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's almost ready to go. Uh, thank, uh, thank you to Clay for speaking out on behalf of the uh, uh, Watsonville Senior Center. They are gonna have a fundraiser August 31st, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to come up with some money uh, for uh, keeping it open. And uh, I'll, I'll donate a little money to that too also. So anyway, thank you, and I, um, I'm looking forward to, uh, like I said, seeing this uh, money uh, wisely spent uh, in both North and South County uh, addressing the homeless issue, thank you. Great, <laughs> thank you very much. I just have a couple comments to add. Um, on item number 22, I wanna thank uh, the team for the work on their integrated pest management report. I think it's, it does important service for our community. Uh, I'd also like to see, um, and I wanna appreciate their efforts to reduce fumatoxins and other rodenticides and ask that next year, the integrated pest management departmental working group also consult with County Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, before next year's re report to discuss and evaluate alternatives to the use of anticoagulant rodenticides and includes that information in next year's report. The goal is to, uh, obviously, is to eliminate the use of anticoagulant rodenticides, which are harmful to wildlife and um, Hopefully that'll be a productive discussion next year. Uh, similar to what has been said on item number 38, the SAFE program, I'd like to thank Sheriff Hart for bringing the sexual assault forensic examiner program back to Santa Cruz County uh, to uh, reduce the uh, additional trauma uh, of having to go over the hill uh, and uh, in order to be examined. And I think the sheriff uh, showed a lot of persistence and effort to, to address this need. 
On item number 41, which is the report back on drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system program treatment outcome analysis, um, I'd like to continue this item to the second meeting in August. Um, I just think any time that we're spending an enormous amount of resources that has uh, both I tremendous impact on people's lives and the community, there has to be a way to evaluate uh, whether, the, whether these programs are working. And so hopefully between now and then we can um, see what the alternatives are. Uh, so now, um, I'd like a motion. Uh, I would move the amended consent agenda. Second. All right, so we got a motion by Leopold and a second by Friend. Uh, these are, this is uh, items 11 through 73.1 with the uh, additional directions uh, and amendments. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Moving on to our uh, regular agenda, this is item number seven, to consider approval of the Santa Cruz County Operational Plan for fiscal years 2019, 2019 through 2021 and direct the C, uh, CAO's office to return in January 2020 with the first biannual progress report as outlined in a memorandum of the County Administrative Officer. Thank you. Good morning. Chair Kennedy and members of the board. Um, so I'm Assistant County Administrative Officer Nicole Coburn, and I'm joined today by Senior Administrative Analyst Sven Stafford. Um, as a member of the team supporting the operational planning process, Sven has played a key role in designing the plan document and the website, which we're going to be showing you today. Together, um, we'll be presenting the final operational plan and pulling up on your screens the website. So this is our agenda. Um, most of the presentation is going to be conducted online as we show you how to navigate the site and look up objectives and key steps. We're going to start by providing a brief overview of the operational plan. Then we'll be highlighting a couple of, of, of the objectives and key steps and showing that navigation. And then finally, we're going to talk about um, how we're going to be updating progress on the plan and updating the website. So this slide shows you or provides an overview of our strategic and operational planning process. We were here last June of 2018 when the board approved the county's first ever strategic plan. The plan contains uh, our vision, mission, and values for the county, as well as 24 high-level goals across six focus areas. The strategic plan spans six years from 2018 through 2024 and is going to be implemented through three two-year operational plans. The County Administrative Office, along with a steering committee and six subcommittees comprised of county staff from every department, spent this past fiscal year developing the first operational plan, and in May, we presented the proposed plan to the board, which the board accepted. Since then, um, we've been working on making refinements to the plan. The plan adds strategies, of which there are 55 objectives and key steps. The proposed plan itself had 172 objectives across 22 departments. And then since we presented the proposed plan, we've added six objectives for a new total of 178. So, here on this slide, we have our six supplemental objectives. Um, these objectives are also shown in the final plan on pages 207 to 210. The objectives that we've added um, touch on developing an action plan to create an age-friendly community in partnership with the Area Agency on Aging or Seniors Council. We're also going to be reducing the county's carbon footprint as one of the objectives. We have a new objective on the HOPES program and engaging more HOPES clients in treatment and reducing arrests. We have an objective that's been added on the syringe services program and establishing targets for that program. We also have a new objective on exiting homelessness and increasing by 15% the number of clients who exit homelessness to permanent housing. And lastly, we have a new objective on AB 109 recidivism and reducing recidivism by 10%. So now that we've um, discussed some of the major changes, I'd like to turn it over to Sven, who's going to take you to the website. Good morning, board. 
the operational plan website is integrated and expands the existing strategic plan website. Uh, as county initiatives such as PRIMO and performance measurement expand, uh, dashboards communicating their results will also be integrated into this site. Uh, before we start looking at it, I'd like to take a moment to thank Tom Milconian and Yang Zhang from ISD for their collaboration and imagination in developing the site with our office. Um, so we'll start the navigation by looking at the plan guide. So the plan guide provides a snapshot to the work that went into the plan's development. Uh, the first page just provides basic information on how strategy and objective statements are structured um, and all of the elements that will allow the public to track objective progress. Uh, the second page here uh, shows the framework. Uh, here we'd like to just make a distinction that the strategic plan goals uh, represent community-wide impacts um, that we would like to see and the operational plan is really a blueprint uh, for the individual actions that the county is taking to create that impact. Uh, now, Nicole will talk about the development process. So I, I briefly mentioned some of what went into developing the operational plan, but as soon as the board adopted the strategic plan last year, our office embarked on developing the operational plan. We had involvement of, had the involvement of over 60 staff from every county department, we also had the input of uh, more than 20 county commissions and 50 key informants um, from various areas, including government, business, no and our nonprofit partners. Developing the plan also required a significant effort to train staff and gain buy-in around the process to build a foundation on, upon which the plan could be built. So in the fall, we spent a considerable amount of time both developing training and delivering that training to staff so that we were all on the same page. In addition, we held open houses in, around the county in, in mid, north, and south county locations. Um, as we move into plan implementation, we intend to continue promoting and soliciting feedback on the plan. Um, as part of our work, our intern, Nathalie Flores, also completed her capstone pro project on providing us with concrete ways that we might improve outreach in South County. Um, we'd like to thank Nathalie for her hard work and contribution to our planning effort. And as many departments mentioned during budget hearings, we are trying to embed our county values and dimensions of equity and sustainability in our, and how we're trying to measure success and achieve our county's uh, goals and vision. So for many of us, this is a new and good way of thinking about our work, and we're currently engaged with our health and human services departments and our data partners to help bridge this gap. Every operational plan objective is funded through the new two-year budget. We recognize the lack of some of the direct links between these documents, and we're going to be working on fully integrating all of our initiatives, the two-year budget, our operational plan, performance measurement, and, and future iterations. So with that, I will turn it back to Sven. So before we dive into the objectives, uh, I'd like to take one minute to talk about the SMART framework, uh, which stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. Uh, the framework not only enables the public to track actual deliverables, uh, but also creates a consistent presentation through which different department objectives can be compared and finally, uh, collaboration is a real uh, hallmark of the plan, and every department objective has a <laughs> collaborating partner. Uh, this is where we introduced what Supervisor McPherson so lovingly referred to as a modern art masterpiece, um, and now we've made that uh, uh, piece interactive, so you can sort by department and see where the administrative office collaborates you can also see, for example, health services and the uh, strong connection that they have with human services. Um, so this is a kind of a neat feature to be able to play around with. Um, so let's look at the, what the plan looks like. So here you'll see the comprehensive health and safety focus area. Uh, in the first column, you'll see the four strategic plan goals. Uh, followed by the second column, which are, which are the strategies that fall under each goal, and in the third column, uh, two 
two columns of objectives uh, that fall under each strategy. So you can see that if you change the goals, the strategies change and the objectives change. Similarly, if you change the strategies, the objectives under each strategy change. And this aligns with uh, the way the strategies and objectives are presented in the document. So if we're looking at the uh, health equity goal and the st first strategy here to advance prevention and intervention services, you can see we have six objectives that fall under that strategy. Uh, if, for example, I'm particularly interested in looking at the clinics, clinic wait times objective, I can click on it and I'll get the full objective, uh, the key steps and the plan references, uh, the collaborating departments, uh, the target of a zero day average wait time and the estimated completion date. Uh, by closing that box, I go back to the original menu. Um, so, you know, this navigation is fairly straightforward. Uh, there is one other neat feature that I'd like to show you. Uh, here in transportation under regional mobility, uh, the strategy is to improve traffic flow to reduce intra-county travel times. And there's an objective here on SoCal congestion, uh, and the target is to increase the level of service. Now, most people intuitively understand that Improving the level of service along this corridor means that, you know, when they get to the Dobbinbus light, they won't have to constantly apologize to their children for using bad words. <laughs> um, what they may not know is that level of service is an actual definition that is used by engineers to describe traffic performance. And so we've created this little rollover, uh, which if you highlight, uh, gives a little further definition of level of service and the exact intersections where we're trying to provide mitigations along Silkel Drive and 41st Avenue. So finally, we have a summary dashboard, the landing page of the operational plan. Here you can see a little um, box up here that tells you the total number objective of objectives, the number completed so far, which is zero, and the number in progress, which is 178. You can sort the objectives by timeline. So here you can see all the objectives that are scheduled to be completed in December 2019. Um, and our office will be updating each objective biannually through the site in line with the dates shown here. Um, as objectives are completed, they'll get a little green completed hat um, and also contain any links to documents and data necessary to substantiate the department's work. Um, you can also sort all the objectives by department. Um, in addition, you can select a collaborating department. So if you wanted to see all the places where information services is supporting departments work, uh, they'll sort for you that way. Uh, information services is by far our leading collaborator. Um, you can also sort the objectives. Each one has been tagged to a county value. So all nine values have objectives tagged to them. And additionally, you can sort them by dimensions of equity and dimensions of sustainability. Um, so as I mentioned at the top, we're working on building out uh, performance measurement and community indicator pieces of the site and plan to be back before the board in the fall with updates on those initiatives. Um, and we're you know, really happy with the website and it will be live to the public as soon as the board adopts the plan. So in summary, this shows you um, our, our strategic plan, had our vision, mission, and values with our six focus areas and 24 goals. The county operational plan adds the 55 strategies, 178 objectives that are SMART and we've placed an emphasis on department collaboration as well as our county values and showing the dimensions of equity and sustainability. And in conclusion, um, we would like to thank the Board of Supervisors, the county administrative officers, officer committee members, steering committee and subcommittee members um, for all of their support and work as we develop the first county's operational plan. This has been a really Re rewarding year of work um, and we are pleased to recommend to the board to first approve the operational plan for fiscal years 2019 through 2021 
and to direct the county administrative office to return in January 2020 with a progress update. This is gonna allow us to update to the website with the new target data, data in December, and then um, take a look at that data and report back in January. And with that, we're happy to answer any of your questions. First, thank you. And uh, I have a, just a small detailed question that just occurred to me, which is in order to get the green hat or check, um, is it based on the target, reaching the target, or is it based on reaching the objective, or is it based on reaching all the key steps? Because in theory, you could, there, for, not all the, uh, for not all the goals, they're not all, there's, there's different ways to reach the, to finish it off. Uh, yeah, I think we're imagining reaching the target would would give you the green hat, and you know, in theory, the key steps lead to to reaching the target. Okay, and what about when the target is different, or it's not inclusive of the whole goal? Like I'm thinking of the Hopes program has three goals, or sorry, th uh, three objectives, but it only yeah. has one target. Yeah, I think for that for that one specifically, we'll. Um, you know, we'll make sure that a green hat indicates that all three okay. targets are being achieved. Great. Um, I'll have more questions, but we'll start with Supervisor Caput. Yeah, sure. Uh, I only have really two questions. Uh, why uh, only 178 objectives? <laughs> and <laughs> and so. the other one, why only 55 strategies? <laughs> So anyway, I, I just want to thank you for your report, and uh, I, I think the uh, I think this is a great idea. I want to thank uh, uh, Carlos uh, for initiating this, and for all of you that have uh, put you know uh, helped out. Thanks. Yeah, this is um, kind of unbelievable, but boy, we've come a long way since uh, just a year and a half ago, and to put us in a place where we can let the public know what we want to do, where we want to go and how we're going to get there is uh, a tremendous thing. It's a tremendous asset for our, our county in, uh, in implementing programs or carrying out programs, but for letting the public know what we want to do and how we're going to get there. Um, I just, um, th these really quantify how the county is, uh, well, is going to further support the environment, seniors, citizens, community members, transportation, housing, all those big issues that we're facing. And um, without, you know, and those who suffer from uh, addictions and mental health conditions and step to, steps to um, relieve or uh, shall we say, um, decrease the dirty syringe litter problem that we're facing today that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, I, I think that the uh, important part about this is that the staff, the county employees themselves think they've been listened to. Uh, they've helped develop these, these projects, um, these, these goals and objectives. And uh, there's, there's priorities that we have established and there's accountability uh, with the process that you've developed. Um, so I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. I want to thank especially the county administrative officer for putting this whole plan in, uh, on, the, on the board to say, let's go do this. And boy, it's really been uh, encouraging to see how much the uh, county staff leadership has come aboard and that the public is going to understand uh, where we're going and why we're going and uh, going there and how we're gonna get there. Uh, especially Nicole Coburn and, and Sven Stafford. Thank you very much for all your work on this. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You know, I was thinking as you were presenting, uh, the, the website is a powerful tool. Um, and uh, the casual observer may not uh, leverage all of, its, all, all of its powers, and you might want to consider taking the video of today's presentation and putting it on the website so people it's a tutorial to how to use the tools because in, in watching you do it, um, there are places that maybe I would have clicked on or maybe wouldn't have clicked on, uh, but knowing that they're there uh, becomes helpful. Um, this operational plan to me is very exciting, uh, super challenging, and, uh, and long needed. Uh, to see to, to link up how we spend our money with what we're actually trying to do and what goals we're trying to accomplish is a milestone in county governance. 
And I wanna really appreciate the work of both Nicole Colburn and Sven Stafford for leading this effort. Um, we didn't, ha there is no roadmap that the county had used previously in order to put this together. Um, to uh, work with departments, to work with the community, to try to, to figure out what would be measurable and meaningful. Um, and you, you've really done an excellent job in terms of pulling all those strands together to come up with a plan um, that is understandable. You can actually read this and know what we're doing, which is not always the case with county uh, uh, or government documents. So thank you uh, for your leadership and, uh, and hard work on this. Um, I think that uh, it will be interesting as we move through uh, the budget process over the coming years to continually tie what we're, we say we wanna do with how we spend our money. And, and uh, this will be a constantly evolving piece one that I think will be helpful uh, for us as we look at our budgets into the future. Uh, and I know that the commitment uh, from my conversation with both of you is to continue to make that tie uh, together. Um, as, uh, if there was one thing that I see that is m missing or not as well reflected in this uh, plan um, is work on the environment. Not to say that all the pieces in here aren't important. I don't, I don't mean to uh, 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 say that, but I think when we t w one of the values around conservation um, is around open space protection, how we protect uh, uh, that which is still wild here. And it would be great in the future to see something uh, related to those pieces or uh, the riparian corridors, which people have come to talk with us over the years about changing or updating or reviewing that ordinance. It, it would be useful, I think, in future iterations to, to, um, uh, to talk about that issue area in a way. I don't have a, 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 goal, a uh, specific target right now, so I'm not, I'm not gonna try to add one, but I think it's something for us to think about in the, in the future. Um, I also uh, will look forward to um, the, uh, the biannual reports. I think that's helpful to do every six months. Um, because I think that we're gonna find, as we do that, areas in which uh, those stretch goals uh, may not fall into the attainable area, and we should acknowledge that. Um, and we're gonna find some things where we set the bar too low and that we're gonna easily get over. Um, and so I think it'll help us strengthen those uh, obje objectives and plans in the future as we review these in this first two year iteration. I wanna thank all the staff members who participated in the committee to help build this operational plan, the hard work of the departments uh, to think strategically about, the, uh, about what issues they wanted to cover and how to uh, represent uh, their department in achieving the goals of the county. Um, I think we're a stronger county government for having a document like this. And I wanna thank everybody who was involved. Supervisor Prime. Thank you, Chair. Again. I'll share in that thanks to the staff work. And just a couple of years ago, um, Supervisor Coonerty and I had um, met with a number of other counties that had gone down this road. And, and I really think though that we're setting a new model for those counties to actually follow that you've built upon something that while was being done in other places, I think this will be even more accessible. And I think that the next step here uh, will be ensuring that uh, to Supervisor Leopold's point, that the community really knows how to engage with it. And in a way, uh, obviously this will be working with Mr. Hoppen and others, but ensuring that uh, the goals are out there, the milestones are out there, and people can see what we're actually doing. And in areas that we're not necessarily meeting, um, why and, and how we can fix that. I think that, that it's, there's an important county story to tell that doesn't get told every day, as people are busy doing the day-to-day -day work of, of their jobs, but there's so many accomplishments that would be on this list that are so important and set on priorities that the community asked us to do. So in other words, let's make sure that it doesn't uh, stop here for, and we just don't continually update the plan, but that that's communicated out so that the community actually understands on the second part. I think that that's of equal importance to just now doing the work and showing the accomplishments is actually ensuring that people see where we're falling short and where we're not. Uh, the goal of this was not just to set a priority set from the community back out, but also have that transparency of whether or not we were doing what we said we would do for the next couple of years. 
and people can uh, pass their judgment the way that they want at that point, but that's, since we work for them, I think that they would like to see uh, the work that we're doing. But it, again, this is, uh, I, I've seen a lot of this stuff through uh, other social innovation centers, and I think that this really is pretty top notch on the work that you're doing, especially on the, on the website. I thought that was an excellent example to be able to see uh, the grades of local intersections and to have, these are, these are questions that come up at, in community meetings and town halls that we hold all the time, and to have people be able to be empowered to be able to find out this information on their own, I, I think this is exactly where it's going. They just need to know it's there. So thank you for your work. I'm excited to see uh, some of this come to fruition. Yeah, and I'll just add, uh, I think, to Supervisor Friend's point, you know, we went from um, really being pretty far behind other counties and having a st strategy and plans uh, to, I think, leapfrogging them with this work. And so thank you to you and the entire team. And the fact that it was done across departments, um, I think will have not only direct benefits in the setting of the goals, but indirect benefits in building relationships and a common, a sense of commonality where we're all in it to solve the problems, even if the goal is uh, primarily a, a health services goal or public works goal, everyone now has, across the county, has more investment in, in addressing that. Uh, so I really appreciate uh, that part, and I think it's, a, it's part of the cultural change that we're seeing at this county, which is really um, gonna be a tremendous benefit for years to come. Going forward, I would say, um, one of the things, and I've said this from the beginning, is I, it'll be okay if we don't reach all these goals. Uh, and in fact, I would expect us not to reach all the goals because um, some of these goals should be stretch goals. They should be um, things that will be tough to achieve. And so, um, you know, as we come back with these biannual reports, um, I don't think there should be, uh, we should be, we should have an open dialogue about where we're, what we're doing well and what, what's not going well and how we wanna uh, address that. Um, so just to set that expectation going forward. Um, I do continue to believe it's really important that we look at our comparable counties uh, when we're looking at how we're doing in specific areas because um, we can look at us, look, we can compare us across the state, but um, this is a huge state, bigger than most countries, and it's not always apples to apples, but when we get into smaller, coast, medium-sized coastal counties, I think it, it is very similar, and we can see where we're ahead and where we're behind and what we can learn from those other counties and then what those other counties can learn from us. Um, so going forward, tying it to the budget will be incredibly important so that in the future, budget hearings will really be about these objectives and then how the money flows to meet these objectives uh, will be, uh, is also important going forward. Um, but, and then, um, and then as, as uh, everyone said, making sure that the community has clear access to this platform you built, which is uh, really accessible and easy to use um, and full of information, making sure that we're getting that out to the people so they can see, see how we're doing. Um, so thank you for your work. I'll now open it up to uh, comments from the public. Whoever wants to come forward. Uh, okay. Hi, um, I just had a question about, um, I didn't see on there, maybe I missed it. Is, is there a housing on that plan as well? I didn't see any, but maybe I just missed it. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole focus area on housing. Okay, there we go, yeah, that's what it's, okay. So did you guys, did you guys, um, I just have to look at the website once it's up there, but did you guys um, put up there uh, so I'm trying to look over here and also the mic. Ups. So did you guys also put in though, um, you have affordable housing, I can't see because I don't my glasses. Um, did you guys put in uh, possible infill or just slight upzoning like going single family to duplex or something like that to try and just kind of pack in a little bit more what we currently have or is it more just expanding outwards? I don't know exactly what your strategy involves currently. Why don't you make your comments and then we'll respond, but now it's your time to speak to us, so. Oh, okay, well that was my comment okay. then, I guess. I'd like to see more of that kind of, maybe allowing for more mixed use development, um, you know, commercial on bottom, residential on top, um, kind of just building up what we already have because of the, because I know the nature of, the nature around here, everybody wants to preserve the environment, so building outwards seems like something that would, you know, possibly hurt endangered species in the area or natives, native flora and fauna. And so if we wanna have more housing, which is a crisis in this county right now, I've lived here my whole life and um, I'm still living in my parents' guest house. Um, 
then um, it would make sense to try and just kind of build on what we already have. So um, that was just my only comment, I guess, or question. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get to it as soon as public comments. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation. I am encouraged because I've gone to a number of the um, public meetings and never really saw a concrete, as I've said before, boots on the ground, how this was, this was all gonna be put into actual action that uh, the public could see and um, understand. So I wanna thank you for this brief um, presentation of the website, it's great. And I think we'll really help the public see what is gonna happen. I'm, I'm encouraged by the work. I think it is also responsive to the past grand jury's um, report that government needed to be, the budget needed to be more um, uh, evidence driven and action driven. So it really addresses the grand jury's findings. And I would like to also acknowledge Supervisor Leopold's request that there be some sort of a tutorial because it is a complex site and um, I, I struggle with computer stuff myself and many people out in the public do not even use a computer. So to that end, I would like to ask that there be some sort of follow-up public meetings to launch this or um, perhaps on radio or community television, PSA, something like that to really help people understand what it is, how to use it, and to appreciate how powerful it is. I would also like to ask that it be taken as presentations to the local high school government classes because I think this is a really good tool and would encourage youth to get involved in government and really feel that what their input is can make a difference and is uh, demonstrated in, in the work that you've done here today. And likewise um, at senior groups, because a lot of the seniors do not use computers. So uh, making it somehow available to them would be, I think, fabulous. Um, I, I want to ask how uh, often the, um, the uh, I've heard there will be a, a semi-annual report. How often will the website be updated in terms of real-time accomplishments? And um, again, I really appreciate that this effort has come from the department heads, from the public, and is being put out there rather than the top-down uh, management that we really have seen in this county in the past. So thank you. Mr. Palacio for launching this. And thank you supervisors for supporting it and I look forward to seeing this. I just wanna add that I would like to see some attention to historic preservation in our county. Thank you very much. So I'm one of the people who doesn't have a computer, doesn't want one, doesn't feel good in front of one. I'm glad that it's helping some people, and I hope there's still phone access for older people like me who don't have a computer to talk to someone about what's going on in the county and different aspects. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, you said um, open dialogue on uh, what's going well and what isn't. I wonder if there'll be critiques in there of what the county is doing. For instance, something you say is going well. Let me just give an example to make it concrete. I'm into reality concrete checks. You put in these uh, school safety, you call it radar signs that cost about a million dollars all over. Radar is a health hazard. It's an expensive, dangerous investment, and you're patting yourselves on the back like this is a good thing. I'm saying, no, it's not. The signs that show school crossing that are bright green or yellow and show someone crossing, those are fine. Those don't emit microwave radiation. So you would be saying this is a great thing the county is doing and the public can look at that. No, in reality, it's not. Another is that 
And this is open dialogue. You want open dialogue, yet you have made it so people cannot comment on the consent agenda items. That's censorship. That's not open dialogue. The other thing you pat yourself on the back for is bringing broadband to the county. That means radiation, and I am really harmed and upset that where I live in Aptos, you've bought 13 cell towers for Verizon 4G and the public right of way, which will likely be 5G, in this rural area within a square mile. I didn't ask for that, I didn't give consent, and neither did anyone there. I'm giving you some open dialogue on what you are making look good that is really harmful. So I don't know where this is in the website, but as someone in my position and an elderly person, I feel this is not a good policy to be putting harmful technologies imposed on the public. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Uh, the brief answer to your question, sir, and you can look at look on the website and see it all. But there's a. Uh, you know, many different strategies for housing, including building more ADUs, accessory dwelling units, farm worker housing, mixed use development, affordable housing projects. We have an urban services line in this county, so there's not going to be sprawl. Um, and it's really, it's going to happen within the, the urban boundaries of our county, um, but it's gonna happen in a lot of different ways because our housing, comp our housing challenges uh, are so deep and complex. Yeah, and I would add that there's also the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan, which is uh, our major effort to think about development differently than we have in the past 40 or 50 years. Um, so uh, now we have, um, uh, we'll be looking at, do we need to adopt this? Yes, we'll direct, uh, we need action. <laughs> yes, yes, we please. do. I would move the recommended actions and express our appreciation to all involved. All right, motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you for your hard work. <clears throat> Moving on to item number eight is to consider approval of the Measure D five-year plan for fiscal year 2019 and 20 uh, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO and the Director of Public Works. Mr. Wiesner. Good morning, Chair, board members, uh, CAO, and members of the public. Um, my name is Steve Wiesner. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works here um, with your county. And uh, today I will be giving uh, our annual Measure D five-year uh, plan update. So um, just as a reminder for everyone, uh, Measure D was a countywide uh, half-cent sales tax measure that was uh, approved by um, our voters in November 2016. Um, it provides a 30-year funding source for uh, various transportation projects countywide. And the county road share uh, this, this next year is estimated at $2.9 million. Um, that number fluctuates with sales, obviously. Um, and uh, <clears throat> as part of the annual requirements for the program, um, we're required to produce a continuous five-year plan and that's approved in a public forum, hence why we're here today. Um, when, uh, when the measure was passed, uh, Public Works um, took a survey of the various communities we have in the un unincorporated areas of our county. And uh, the three top uh, things that our, our community members wanted to see was uh, maintenance and repair of our county roadways, um, mostly in neighborhoods, um, and uh, to improve safety as well. Okay, so I'm just gonna highlight a little bit of what we're gonna be doing this summer. Um, the project actually has been, been awarded. Uh, the contractor is making preparations countywide um, for resurfacing in the various uh, areas of our county. Um, in District 1, uh, we're gonna be hitting some of the roads in the Live Oak area. Uh, the work's gonna involve uh, uh, some the resurfacing that involves uh, multiple layers of, of material. We call that a cape seal. So we'll come through, we'll do some isolated base repairs. We'll slurry it, um, or we'll chip seal it, and then we'll slurry on top of that. In District 2, we're gonna be down in the Rio Del Mar area doing, doing some of the roads in the, in the flats. 
In District 3, we're gonna um, finish out the project that we started last summer. Um, we had done uh, about two thirds of Martin Road, um, so we'll be completing uh, the Martin Road resurfacing project this summer. Um, now in District 4, um, because we have very few roads down there, it takes a few years to build up enough of a bank to do, to do a significant project down there. Um, and so uh, we're reserving funds for the next couple of years uh, to do a project uh, in next summer. And so we've been banking some Measure D funds down in the south area of the county due to a significant project um, proposed for Lakeview Drive. Uh, I will note that, uh, that there were just uh, some minor changes to the plan this year. One of one, them was to uh, work with a District 4 supervisor to, to rework some of the priorities in the South County area. Um, in District 5, uh, we're moving on down to Ben Loman. We had done a portion of Boulder Creek last summer, and so we're, we're gonna be working in downtown Ben Loman this summer. Um, okay, and uh, so just to also remind uh, your board um, how we decide which roads uh, we pick um, in which communities of our county. Um, as you're aware, the county maintains a, a database-driven pay payment management system, um, which basically rates the scores of all of our, uh, of our roads um, on a pavement condition index, and that's just simply zero being a totally dirt road to 100 being a brand new road. Um, we use that as a tool to inform us uh, of the, how to use our limited um, funds and resources. And so we work with your board, we work with the community members. Um, I will note that today we have with us uh, Matt Machado, our director, and some other public works staff members, including our program manager um, for the pavement management program, Casey Carlson. Um, and uh, earlier this year, we had presented uh, to your board our most recent pavement management survey. Um, and so we're in the process now with our consultant to look at all of our different funding sources that we've had based on our, our estimates for future resources um, to come up with a, a new five-year plan, um, both for our local roads and for our larger federal aid routes, and those are the routes that carry the larger amount of traffic. Um, and so we've opted in this year's five-year plan to bank and reserve the fourth and fifth year of the plan. We anticipate next year that we come back with a fully developed five-year plan. Okay, so with that, um, simply uh, we have for uh, before you today, um, recommended actions are to adopt the attached Measure D five-year plan for the 1920 fiscal year um, and to authorize Public Works to submit a, submit a copy of the approved board package to the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Um, so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Do we have any questions? Supervisor Friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wiesner, as always. Um, I do have a couple specific questions to my district. Uh, in regards to the 2020 plan, which has Seacliff in it. A couple streets I saw fell off on 2020, uh, including the Hillcrest component and the Coates component, the west side, in other words, of, of State Park Drive. Is this just purely a cost-related reality to it? Um, some of the roads that did actually fall off were related to other improvements that were happening in that area. Um, I think there were some sanitation projects that needed to be done and we didn't want to resurface that street before the road got cut into to fix the sanitation line. Right, so that's in, that's in Rio Del Mar, that's, that's on true. Cliff, that's Cliff yeah. and Martin. And, and that was question number two. I'll get back to the Seacliff question. So getting okay. onto the, the sanitation project, then in theory I should see Martin and Cliff show up on 2020, but they don't. So meaning that it was a one-year delay associated with the sanitation work. Um, but it's not showing up to be done. So is this being now funded as a sanitation-related road project? I mean, is sanitation funding it, or is it still a Measure D project? No, it should come back in a future year, and I'll look to Casey Carlson. Casey, do you have, can you? Go back to that slide, it has. Can you come up to the podium, Casey? Yeah. Yeah, there shouldn't be any changes to the plan um, other than that that project was going to be delayed in the Rio Del Mar area. Okay, then in theory, then it should show up as something that would occur in the in the next, it was supposed to be done this summer. Correct. Correct. So, but under the, the attachment that you guys have that I'm looking at, it shows roads anticipated <laughs> as a 2020 proposed project. Um, 
would it not be done immediately after sanitation in 2020 is my point. So, so is it not showing up because it's funded through sanitation funding or is it not showing because you're not intending to do it in 2020, which is just different from what I've been told? Um, so which road specifically are we talking about? We're talking about the sanitation projects at, at Cliff, the entire length of Cliff and the Martin connector. Yeah, so that's still shown on the five-year plan. It's not highlighted in green because it wouldn't be done in 2020. So it would be done in a future fiscal year. And, and most of that has to do with just the timing of the sanitation project? Okay, so, 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 so getting so back to it, the, yeah. the sanitation project's supposed to be done so that this would be done next year. So I'm trying to figure out why it's not showing up as a green highlighted project for next year, considering the sanitation project's supposed to be done by then. That's a good question. Uh, let us get back to your office on that. Um, okay. That's really in concert, us working in concert with sanitation to make sure that they're actually gonna be able to enact that repair this year. Okay. So it is likely that we'll, we would be able to bring that back as a project if they do enact their repair. Okay, and then on so. to Casey, to your point, that Hillcrest from State Park, from Marvis to, to State Park, and Coates from Hillcrest to Seacliff was originally on the previous five-year plan to be done in 2020. So I, that when I said it fell off, it's not there. I mean, it's, it's not highlighted to be done. So is that a, just a pure cost? Has there been a cost escalator that required that road to come off? There's no sanitation project occurring there, so. Yeah. Um, no, so the, the point is that what's, the full page is the five-year plan, and so green is what we think we can get done next year, and that's, that can always be changed with your office if you have a different priority that you would like us to focus on, and the next year we can always change that. Okay. Um, this is just, the green is to indicate what we think we can accomplish next year. Okay. Based on current prices, and yes, it is, it's a fluid situation, right? right? So what we show you on this plan is what we anticipate for the next construction season, 2020. Um, it's likely that we would come back with some minor changes as well based on current construction pricing next year. And if we're successful at the RTC from a bonding component, I imagine we would come back for a, a larger discussion about the grouping of these roads that are within specific areas, correct? Sure, we'd absolutely be able to advance a lot more quickly. Okay, yeah. thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Do you have an idea of what the average PCI is for the roads that are being um, uh, done this year? Well, it varies quite a bit. Um, and I think taking a guess at what an average would be would be difficult because I think the rural area of the county varies drastically from you know some of the more urban areas. Um, and um, one thing I can say is that when we do slurry seal treatments, um, the roads tend to be in pretty decent shape. Um, if, they're, if the PCI is really low, a seal, a seal product is not really the right product. And so it goes along with pavement management theory that we'd be trying to seal coat the roads that are actually in fairly decent shape, so north of 50. Okay. Um, and the, uh, uh, I'm just curious about uh, submitting a, a plan to the RTC that doesn't have recommendations for year four and five. We're allowed to do that? We are, and other, and other jurisdictions are doing the same thing as well. Um, in particular for our program, because it's a pavement management program, I, I, you can imagine how difficult it would be for us to predict in the fifth year what the economy is going to be like then, what the contracting uh, climate's going to be like. And so, you know, we did our best job for the first cut, um, and we are opting to, you know, to bank the fourth and fifth year. We think we'll be able to come back next year, and it'll be based on current pricing, obviously, um, with recommendations for what we think years four and five will be at that time. Okay. So, yeah, it is typical. Other agencies are doing the same thing. Um, I think those are all the questions. Thank you for the work. Welcome. Supervisor McPherson? Yeah. Um, I can't go without saying thank you voters for approving Measure D so we're able to do any of this. And uh, But the fact of the matter is you can't please them all all the time. And um, I, the, the main criteria is some of your most heavily traveled areas and uh, residential areas. I mean, that was the biggest percentage that was going from Measure D to address neighborhood ro uh, roads in essence. Is that, was that the most heavily traveled? What was your criteria? Was that basically it? Right, so basic pavement management theory is always gonna tell you to go after your most heavily traveled roads. They deteriorate very rapidly. Um, when Measure D was passed by the voters, uh, the, the, the bucket that we're getting funding for county roads in was in the neighborhood, neighborhood projects uh, bucket. And so, you know, we've made a commitment to try and go after um, some resurfacing in some of our neighborhoods which have been neglected, you know, for, for a couple decades now. Um, so Measure D, as it currently stands today, we're really trying to apply towards neighborhood streets. Right, I probably get, as we probably get as many calls on transportation roads uh, as anything, and I wanna thank you for uh, 
making the tough choice, but it, it, the choice had to be made and uh, just uh, addressing what you can with the resources that we have. And I'm just thankful that we have this $2.9 million to get this done from Measure D proceeds. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this right now. So uh, again, I wanna thank the Measure D voters. Um, uh, this is not an easy task for you, I know, and I think uh, I can understand that you're not wanting to go beyond three years. I mean, that's um, probably a max of what you can do for anticipation of what you might be able to do in, in those three years. So I appreciate your efforts in putting this together. Um, we're, we'll get, I just want to let the public know that we can't do all of this uh, at the beginning and the first five years, as a matter of fact, but um, I think that uh, your your process of what you've, you've done and how you're going about it is, is just fine and uh, I appreciate your efforts and again, the, the voters for Measure D. Thank you, we're appreciative as well. Supervisor Caput. You bet, thanks. <coughs> I know you're struggling with uh, the budget and everything and trying to make uh, uh, all five districts, uh, you know, solid for the next few years. Uh, what, uh, what, Two projects would you say are like priority for District 4, which would be South County? Um, yeah. Well, we'll yeah. Yeah. Um, so, on a larger scale, um, you know, the, the, the the federal aid routes, the bigger routes that carry a lot of the traffic, including Buena Vista Drive, right, which is right in front of the landfill there, um, those, are, those are big priorities. So, Freedom Boulevard, San Andreas, you know, Buena Vista. And um, when we start looking at uh, projects that Measure D uh, could be applied to based on the sort of neighborhood um, criteria, um, you know, I think I think Lakeview is a really great road to go after. Um, it's a heavily traveled road. Uh, it's in a neighborhood. Um, it's a cut through traffic between 152 and 129. And so, right. you know, I think that's a pretty high priority for that for us as well. Uh, that one, uh, well, uh, the, the Lakeview area, that's just about ready to uh, go, right? Well, it, so it'll be next summer. We think right. that we've banked enough money by next summer to be able to enact a project out there. And uh, I guess along with that, the other one would be what, 152 and Houlihan and College? Yeah, certainly that intersection's a priority for us. That's in a different program um, area, um, but absolutely that's a priority. Okay. Yeah. And then there's a couple of smaller ones. Uh, it's kind of like that preventive, uh, uh, if you prevent something before it gets worse, it's a lot cheaper to fix than after it collapses sure. or whatever. So wh I guess two of them one would be Casserly, there's a washout there not too far from the bridge. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult fix, but if it does wash out completely, it would be, uh, I mean, it'd be a huge problem. So I guess we're looking at that. And then the other would be uh, Peckham. Uh, Peckham Road uh, off of, that's off of Casserly also. Right. No, th that's off of- Carlton, uh, right? Right. Yeah, so it's off of Carlton. Those are both storm, storm damage yeah, repair that, projects. That one could be fixed, I think, fairly- ba Peckham's quickly. this summer. We plan to pick Peckham this, fix Peckham this summer. Um, the other one on Casserly is, is a larger storm damage repair project that is gonna take a little bit more time. It just, uh, it's uh, the one on Casserly just sheared off, I guess. Yep. And uh, I'm not sure how the engineers figure that out, but uh, it, it's a tough fix, but it's a lot, I guess, cheaper not to fix it as soon as possible rather than if it completely washes out. That's right. Yeah. It is currently winterized to try and you know keep it from getting worse over this next winter, um, but it's an important project to us as well. Yeah I, I, yeah, I appreciate you guys showing all this interest and getting around, going around and uh, you you can picture what I'm talking about. It's oh, yeah. not because we've been out there. And Absolutely. I, I think that's really important. I, I appreciate that personal connection that you seem to show every district. So thank you very much. Great, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about this item if they're interested. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for this report. I appreciate it very much. I um, also appreciated the discussion about the um, prioritization of repairs. Um, I was gonna bring up the stretch of SoCal Drive between Rio Del Mar and Freedom that's just a nightmare, but I understand that the Measure D money needs to be uh, focused on neighborhoods. There are, and, and that brings me to my question, what do you define as a neighborhood? Uh, there are a lot of people that live off of that road 
uh, up, up on Monroe and apartments there. Is that a neighborhood? Um, if it is, then that stretch of road really needs to be addressed and soon because it is a major thoroughfare that serves a neighborhood, a multiple neighborhoods. My neighborhood on off of Cathedral Drive um, has not seen work that I remember in the 35 years that I've lived there, and it's a neighborhood, it's a, r a rural neighborhood with over 300 houses, and it's our only way in and way out, and a fire evacuation route at that. Spanish Ranch Road up in Supervisor Leopold's area also serves a rural neighborhood and is in such disrepair their fire department has told them they will not bring a water tender up there because it's not safe. So I would like to ask that those sorts of rural neighborhoods be included in Measure D money, as well as the urban neighborhoods, because um, the rural neighborhoods also deserve to have attention. And in many cases, such as uh, Spanish Ranch Road, um, my area, certainly Paulson Road in Supervisor Caput's area. Those are neighborhoods, and it is often their only way in and way out. So to preserve their safety and their property values, we do have to give the rural neighborhoods some attention. Thank you very much. I think Becky's points are well taken, and that it raises the question, where is the money? Why isn't the money for all of these neighborhoods that need this type of repair? And I think of this overall picture of half of our tax dollars are going towards the military budget and to kill people in other countries. and. Uh, I, I don't like what our half of our tax dollars are doing, and I would rather see these tax dollars go towards road repair, parks, schools, and this image comes to mind all the time of this bumper sticker. It'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need, and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber as a 30-year public school teacher, retired almost for 20 years now, that bumper sticker of decades ago still has a great deal of truth to it. I'd like to see you advocate for more of our tax money going to county needs and not be siphoned off into the military budget. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes public comment. I will note that uh, because of the storm damage and that the federal government for the first time in anyone's memory is denying emergency uh, repairs, that we're actually spending a disproportionate amount of our budget that we thought we'd be spending on urban areas, on rural areas, because the Trump administration is deciding to play politics with federal emergency dollars. Um, so it's not even a matter of redirecting money in the federal budget from military, it's trying to get the the traditional money that was always has always been available to communities after disasters, and we're being denied that, <clears throat> and it's having a huge impact on our ability to uh, provide services across the county, but also specifically in our urban areas. Um, is there uh, any chair? I will just say that uh, I'm grateful also for the voters of, uh, passing Measure D because it did allow us to get money into the rural areas in a way that we didn't. The first, I know in my district alone, the first year of Measure D, that's where we spent all the dollars. Um, so there's a lot of needs in the community. We spend every dollar we have on uh, roads. Um, we th took action, and we will take action later today, to take $2 million out of reserves to spend on roads. So uh, this is a board that's committed to uh, ensuring that we have uh, adequate funding for infrastructure based on the limits that we have in terms of the county budget. We're gonna continue to try to find ways, whether that through bonding, through other means uh, to fund infrastructure, but this is a critically important role of government and uh, we're gonna try to uh, meet the needs of the community. Uh, I would move the recommended actions. We got a motion by Leopold, a second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 
Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for your work. Uh, item number nine is to continue a public hearing to consider certification of the vo vote results for county service areas uh, number 15, Huckleberry Woods, number 17, White House Canyon, number 26, Hidden Valley and Muir Drive, the Muir Zones, number 42, Sunlit Lane, number 58, Ridge Drive, zones three and four, number uh, 59, McGaffigan Mill Road, and to take related ac actions as outlined in a memorandum of the Deputy CAO and the Director of Public Works. Good morning, I'm Sonia Likens, Administrative Services Manager for Public Works. Um, thank you for reading off all the CSAs, I don't have to do that. Uh, I just wanna mention that the increase in assessments were requested by the residents of the CSAs, not by Public Works or the county. Um, we have the, I have the ballot tallies if you're interested in having that for each of the votes. We had one that failed and the rest were all passed by the residents. Um, if you have any further questions, I can answer them. Are there any questions? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. I would move the recommended actions on all these CSAs. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Item number 10 is to consider an ordinance amending chapter 8.04 of the Santa Cruz County Code pertaining to the county election campaign contribution control and to schedule the ordinance for final adoption on August 6, 2019 as outlined in a memorandum of the county clerk. Ms. Pellerin, thank you for waiting patiently for this item. Sure, my pleasure, thank you. Happy um, belated birthday, by the way. The what? Happy belated birthday. Thank you, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, I, we're bringing this ordinance back after your feedback from the last time I was here. So we have kept that third pre-election statement and the trigger for filing the 410 at 1000 and we put back in the restrictions on, in the county ordinance to limit campaign contributions for businesses and labor unions. And everything else stayed the same with the increase in the, um, the cap on contributions. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? No, I'll, I'll just say I appreciate the work of our elections department. Uh, the, the preview of the uh, new ballots the other day uh, were, were very good. Uh, I didn't get to see it, but my staff all went down and checked it out. It's pretty amazing. And I appreciate uh, working with us on this, uh, on this ordinance to get it th to sure. be tuned right. Thank you. So. you know, on that note, on the voting system, they did leave me with a, um, a tablet and the ballot, so I'm happy to do you know, presentations to any organization, so let me know. Thank you. Great. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board and Supervisor Caput. Is my, your microphone, microphone. please. If you can explain the uh, limits, uh, you know, succinctly. It's just pretty much two, two changes, right? Right, so for individual contributions, we moved it from 400 to 500, right. and then we built in a $25 increase every two years, and that will start January 22. And everything else stayed the same? Yes. Right, thank you. Yeah, well, and then we changed the filing deadlines for those pre-election statements to conform those with the Political Reform Act. Uh, oh, that's because they moved the primary up? L lots of reasons. Sure, yeah. that, that makes it really tough uh, for somebody running now. Right, right, so we're, we're conformed with, the, our, our ordinance matches the Political Reform Act except for that one additional third pre-election statement which we keep. Yeah, yeah you're gonna have to knock on doors during Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes, I get to be here <laughs> designing ballots. That's not good. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, I would entertain a motion. I would move the recommended action. Motion by Leopold. Second, Second by McPherson. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. We will now recess until our 1.30 uh, last day budget hearings.
reconvene for our uh, continued budget hearings and our last day agenda. Uh, first, we'll start with item number 56, which is uh, consideration of late additions to the agenda, corrections, additions, or deletions. Mr. Palacios, do we have any? Yes, there are a couple of corrections on the regular agenda. Um, item number 57, attachment B should read packet pages 63 through 186. There's also additional materials, revised memo, packet page six, and additional materials, revised uh, unified fee schedule addendum, attachment C, packet page 15. <coughs> and then on item 59, there's additional materials, revised attachment I, packet page 60. All right. So let's move on to item number 57, which is uh, the unified uh, fee schedule. Public hearing to consider the resolution uh, approving amendments to the unified fee schedule for fiscal year 2019-2020, including the addendum as provided in the reference budget documents and outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative office. Uh, first, I'll ask if there are any questions. Seeing none, I'll ask now ask if there's any public comment to this item. Seeing none, I'll bring it back for uh, consideration. I move approval of the, uh, all the items with the five schedule. All right, so we have a uh, motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Moving on to item number 58, uh, which is to consider the continuing agreements list for 2019, 2020, including the addendum and take related outline uh, actions as outlined in a memorandum of the CAO. Any questions? Is there any public comment? Seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the board. That's okay. Is there a motion? I would move the recommended action. I'll second. Uh, all right, motion by Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Moving on to item number 59, this is the con uh, consider the last day reports, items 2A through 2J for the 2019-2020 proposed budget as outlined in a memorandum of the CAO. I'll ask if there are any questions or comments. Supervisor, Mc Supervisor McPherson. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, um, on the waste stream assessment for syringes, um, I'd like to reiterate that the goal we're interested in here is uh, developing a plan to mitigate the syringe waste uh, problem in our community. Um, the hazardous impacts that they've, it's, uh, are considerable and many community members are blaming the county for uh, those reports that we've been hearing recently. Um, of course, we support um, the harm reduction among uh, IV drug users, and we, but we also support reducing the harm of dirty needles uh, being inflicted on our public spaces. Uh, that's a serious health hazard now that, that I think that our health services agency needs to address uh, more, more, and I, I would like to uh, make a motion on that, but uh, I don't know if there's anybody else that would like to discuss on any other items. I'd, I'd also like to, talk about the probation grants and just congratulate, uh, but I, I could, I would like to make a motion that we direct the Health Services Agency report back to the board on September 24th uh, with a comprehensive plan to clean up and prevent needle litter uh, countywide using existing funds in the Health Service Agency budget uh, that don't, won't have a, an impact on the general fund. I think we would be able to do that. Okay. Uh, well. Um, I'm supportive of that motion, um, and then the overall items. <clears throat> I'd say you got uh, downtown streets team, streets team cleaned up 6,000 needles in the city of Santa Cruz last year. The city parks department cleared up 4,000 needles. Uh, then if you add in schools, other uh, departments, uh, and citizens, you're probably looking at tens an additional 10,000 needles, uh, which is a major public health issue, and we have to uh, we have to have a plan to address it. Yeah, I look forward to the uh, to the study with the uh, California Department of Public Health and their work uh, to tr try to figure out new ways that we can do it. I also look forward to hearing from the city of Santa Cruz about th their interest in placing disposal kiosks right. at uh, places in the city. Uh, I'll just comment on a couple of the other items on here. Uh, I too want to acknowledge uh, the probation department for their great work in getting uh, nearly $7 million worth of grants into our community. Uh, that will not only uh, 
uh, provide really great services and re increase public safety. Uh, but seven million dollars into the community over a couple of years is is a nice uh, boost. Um, and I also um, uh, want to uh, uh, thank uh, General Services. Um, uh, I think it's on this item that is going to be uh, adding money to the Resource Conservation District um, to uh, help with the Fire Safe Council. Great. Any other uh, questions or comments? I'll just give my, uh, in addition to supporting the direction from Supervisor uh, McPherson, just give my thanks to all the departments. Um, the budgets are, are uh, big and challenging documents and then to pull the last bit, bits together over a short period of time is always a challenge and um, I'm just grateful for everyone's work. Uh, is there any members of the public would like to speak to us about these last day reports? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. I make the motion well, that we approve um, as directed with the addition with with the additional direction. All right. So we got a uh, motion and uh, motion by McPherson. I'll second it. Do you know what the additional direction is? Okay. We got a second by friend. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. That passes unanimously. Moving on to item number sixty, uh, as the board of. Uh, as the B Board of Supervisors of the Redevelopment Successor Agency, consider and authorize the auditor, controller, tax collector with the concurrence of the CAO to make necessary year-end adjustments uh, and adjustments for 2019-2020 due to increases and decreases in available financing and approve the 2019 through 2021 uh, redevelopment, redevelopment successor uh, agency budgets as referenced in the outline budget documents and memorandum of the CAO. Are there any questions? Uh, is there any public comment? Seeing no public comment, I'll bring it back to the board. I would move the recommended actions for the redevelopment successor agency. I'll second. Motion by Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. And then item number 61 is uh, to consider the 2019-2021 County of Santa Cruz proposed budget concluding actions and authorize the auditor, controller, tax collector with the concurrence of the CAO to make necessary year-end adjust adjustments and adjustments for the 2019-2020 due to increases and decreases in the available financing and approve the 2019 through 2021 County of Santa Cruz proposed budget including supplemental last day and concluding report items as outlined in the memorandum of the CAO. Uh, Mr. Chair, sure. um, yeah, I'd like to make some comments on this. Um, the um, Relative to the state budget, I'm glad to see an additional investment from the state on the homelessness and the affordable housing issues. Those are big issues statewide and certainly in our county. Um, and I am very glad to see the ongoing fix on funding and the in-home support services over the next four years. That is a huge, uh, uh, comfort zone for us uh, to enjoy because uh, we have been on top of this and I, I, the in-home support services are invaluable to our community. On um, the um, the road repair work, I'd like to say I think that's uh, the, to commend the auditor's department office and the CAO for recommending a creative plan on how to address these repairs that are more than we can address uh, really in any one year, but we're seeing what we can do and how to get there. And that includes borrowing uh, $2 million from our natural disasters reserve and 5.2 million from our workers' compensation reserve to be repaid through the green waste recovery vehicle impact and franchise fees, um, as well as the state gas and PG&E franchise agreement. It's complicated, but uh, I thank you for addressing this very, very serious problems, and hopefully Congress will address uh, future federal reimbursement deadlines. Um, this, um, this could be $35 million of additional uh, repairs uh, at stake in Santa Cruz County alone, which represents half of the damage of those storms statewide. Uh, it's pretty, it's unbelievable how much we were hit in those storms, but uh, I really do appreciate the efforts that were made by the auditor's office and the CAO to help us um, address those concerns as quickly as we can. And uh, f also to for the Felton Nature Discovery Park, uh, thank the CAO's office and the Parks Department, the Fel uh, Felton Library friends, uh, for working together to close the gap between 
a very high bid in our budget to get this project started. Uh, the library park um, is meant to uh, go, uh, and the park are meant to go hand in hand, and uh, we look forward to the opening in early 2020. And once that's done, I think the Boulder Creek Library will start a re remodeling project as well. So very appreciative of the work that uh, the auditor's uh, office and the CEO has done on this, and for the entire budget for that matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Supervisor Leopold? Uh, I, think, I think he wanted to say something. Oh, sorry. Okay. sorry okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I want to thank everybody for all the hard work they put in, uh, uh, you know, for this whole budget and putting it together so we can vote on it. Uh, I think everybody's tried to be fair. And uh, a, a comment on the libraries, uh, uh, how important they are. Uh, my, my daughters, uh, the eight-year-old twins, they read some books, uh, Dolphin Tale 1 and 2. And then uh, they wanted to get the, uh, after they checked the books out and read them, they wanted to see the movies, uh, the DVD, I guess, or whatever. So uh, the only one that had them is the Brant Forty branch here in Santa Cruz. And I went over there and they were able to check it out, even though I have a Watsonville library card. They, uh, I filled out a quick form and everything. So anyway, that's, that's the importance of it. Uh, so I, I've got to take those, DVDs home today and show them to my daughters. So anyway, <laughs> thank you for all the work you've done on the uh, budget. And uh, we're, uh, that's a comment and then before, we're gonna have public comment and then we'll have motions, okay. Correct. Um, I'm waiting for my invitation to movie night at the Caput House. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Uh, I want to uh, I want to th uh, thank uh, Christine Mowry uh, for the work that you do on the budget, uh, putting together all these different pieces from um, all the different departments is a magic trick each year. Um, and I appreciate the work that we all have done, every department, uh, the board, the CAO's office, to manage our resources wisely. Um, and I'm grateful for the voters. Uh, for passing Measure G last fall, we're in a better shape than most uh, jurisdictions. Uh, it doesn't mean we're, we're uh, free and easy. Uh, we still have to do a good job uh, managing the resources, but this budget is, um, expands in some areas. Uh, uh, with the operational uh, plan, we now have something that, not only a budget that states our values, but a, a, a vision document that, uh, that speaks to those goals and an operational plan to figure out how we'd actually uh, achieve them. Um, it's a new era uh, for our budgeting process, and I appreciate the leadership from our CAO uh, to assemble the staff, to uh, design the process, uh, so we can look at things differently here, uh, to be more transparent, uh, and uh, to meet the needs of the community. So I appreciate the work of all 2,400 plus employees uh, at the County of Santa Cruz, uh, because without them, uh, these documents don't mean much. Uh, but by working together, we're helping uh, move Santa Cruz forward, and uh, I'm grateful for that opportunity, and thank you for all the work to help make it happen. Great, uh, and I wanna invite uh, our CAO to say a few words. Yes, uh, I wanted to thank the board for your support uh, over the last two years and your support of this new process that we're, we're doing. I know that you have been very supportive from the beginning and, and in fact you um, pointed me to some models in other counties which we helped, uh, which helped us in our, our path. And I agree with some of your earlier comments that I think we not only have emulated some other counties but we've surpassed. Uh, it's amazing the work that our staff has done. And, and so um, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my staff in the C County Administrative Office, especially Christina Mowry, um, who's done an amazing amount of work, um, and um, Nicole Coburn, Elisa Benson, and Melody Serino, and all of our analysts, in addition to the department heads, uh, the departmental staff who work on these budgets. It's a huge lift every year doing the budget, and this year and the last two years, we've actually added on to the workload. We've added on a strategic plan, which uh, was very um, a big effort, and then this year we even upped the effort in putting together a two-year budget and an, a very uh, detailed operations plan, all while doing the new PRIMO uh, continuous process improvement. And this is uh, all done without any new staff. 
just uh, making our staff take on additional responsibilities and and having them work a little bit differently. And they've done an amazing job. It's just, it's just incredible. There are some counties that have whole offices of uh, continuous process improvement or performance measurement uh, or strategic planning, and we've done it with our existing staff, and we only have done it because of the cooperation of the departments. So I wanted to thank all of the staff, tell them how much I appreciate all their work and how proud I am to be in this organization at this time. It's a very proud moment this morning when I was sitting here, uh, not only watching our staff and demonstrate what they've done over the past year, but also seeing the new staff that are coming. It's just a very proud and hopeful moment, moment for the county. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it's, I'm not sure budget documents are meant to evoke a lot of emotion, uh, but, but when you think about uh, the amount of work and the collaborative work um, that went into this, and then the, as Supervisor Cap mentioned, the good results that come out day to day where people may not even connect it back to the budget document, um, there's a lot to be proud of, and, uh, and, and to have our finances be in a good shape, um, is, is something we should also also be grateful uh, and cognizant of um, and committed to. So thank you very much for that work. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Let me make, uh, <clears throat> yeah, one, uh, one thing I wanted to stress too is uh, I think all of us get uh, complaints about, of course, roads and uh, all the districts are getting their fair share. I want everybody to know that District 4 is getting a fair share. All of us have roads when they call up and they say this road hasn't been fixed. It's because there was so much damage that was done two years ago during the big storms. And I think every one of us has big areas where we can't get to every road. Uh, we are working on them and we are working very hard and we are getting a lot of major roads uh, funded and fixed in every district. And uh, so I think we, we all, you know, understand that. And then I will, uh, we're gonna have a motion and then I'll. Okay. You can make it. I'll, well, you know, I'll make a motion, but I do have one exception. Sure. All the actions on item number 61, yeah. the recommended actions, I would second that. Okay, so we got a motion by McPherson and a second by Leopold. I'll be voting uh, yes on everything. I will uh, make one exception. That'll be on, uh, I'm voting no on uh, item under core investments, page 156, and that's uh, $67,000 taxpayer money of uh, Planned Parenthood Marmonte. Okay, so I, I think we can take, still take this all in one motion and register a no vote. Okay, uh, so uh, <clears throat> we have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? So it passes unanimously with the exception of Supervisor Caput voting no on that uh, particular item. Uh, and with that, uh, we are adjourned. And thank you everyone for your work. <laughs> That's gotta be getting easier.